Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager, and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. OK. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh. It's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh, dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's a bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes. And our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault. It's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester, we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? 
That hasn't happened at all, as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave... Good morning, everybody. Now, last week we were looking at the positive effects that computers have had on our society. This week I'd like to talk about one of the negatives. Computer viruses. OK, so what is a computer virus? Well, it's a software program that's been created by a human programmer with the single intention of corrupting and destroying useful programs. Put in simple terms, it's a way of causing lots of trouble for ordinary people. It's known as a virus because although it's not a biological organism, it functions in a similar way in that it looks for a host, that is, a body, your computer, in which to live and multiply, with the one aim of destroying that host. Let's go back 50 years. In 1949, the first model of a computer virus program was presented in a paper by John von Neumann. Soon after this was published, a game known as Core Wars appeared on the scene. Core Wars was initially created for intellectual entertainment by three Americans working on large mainframe computers. By the 1980s, for the very small sum of $2 postage, anyone could get details on how to play Core Wars and create programs that could escape from the game and destroy other programs. Computer viruses are picked up in much the same way as their biological counterparts. That is, through contact with others. And this can happen very easily, as literally millions of people are in touch with each other by email every day. Virus programs are often intentionally placed within useful programs such as commercial websites or they're included in software that you might have got from friends or downloaded from somewhere without knowing its real source. It seems quite hard to believe that anyone would go to all this trouble to intentionally spoil the data of other people, but the rise in the number of computer software infections and the amount of lost data that we are seeing these days is proof that these attackers are going to extremes to do just that, going out of their way to create programs that hide inside legitimate software and cause all sorts of errors that their victims will then mistake for hardware failure, believing that the problem lies with their own computer. There are many types of virus, such as worms and Trojan horses, and each has its own purpose. One function of a Trojan, for instance, is to destroy and delete files on your computer. They attack by generating a lot of email and internet traffic on your machine until it becomes completely overloaded and you can no longer use your computer. It then does the same to your friend's machines. Bad enough, you may think. But a Trojan also allows the attacker to use the victim's computer to purchase goods with stolen credit cards or access illegal websites. So, what can we do to combat these people? Well, the first thing is to realize that virus programmers succeed because people are not always careful about where they get their programs from. So, number one, be very careful. And I don't just mean that you should be careful about the source of your software, you also need to take care with emails and avoid any messages which are suspicious looking. So the second golden rule is avoid trouble. For instance, do not open any message that says I love you or win fifty dollars. 
A third thing we can do involves trying to find out exactly how the viruses work. In other words, we need to understand the viruses. And of course, there's a good selection of antivirus software available on the market now to combat the virus plague. So another way of protecting ourselves and our computers is to be well prepared. If you follow these basic rules, you really shouldn't have any problems. Today we're going to look at an important area of science, namely nanotechnology. So, what is it? Nano means tiny, so it's science and engineering on the scale of atoms and molecules. The idea is that by controlling and rearranging atoms, you can literally create anything. However, as we'll see, the science of the small has some big implications, affecting us in many ways. There's no doubt that nanotechnology promises so much for civilization. However, all new technologies have their teething problems. And with nanotechnology, society often gets the wrong idea about its capabilities. Numerous science fiction books and movies have raised people's fears about nanotechnology with scenarios such as inserting little nanorobots into your body that monitor everything you do without you realising it, or self-replicating nanorobots that eventually take over the world. So, how do we safeguard such a potentially powerful technology? Some scientists recommend that nanoparticles be treated as new chemicals, with separate safety tests and clear labelling. They believe that greater care should also be taken with nanoparticles in laboratories and factories. Others have called for a withdrawal of new nanoproducts, such as cosmetics, and a temporary halt to many kinds of nanotech research. But as far as I'm concerned, there's a need to plough ahead with the discoveries and applications of nanotechnology. I really believe that most scientists would welcome a way to guard against unethical uses of such technology. We can't go around thinking that all innovation is bad, all advancement is bad. As with the debate about any new technology, it is how you use it that's important. So, let's look at some of its possible uses. Thanks to nanotechnology, there could be a major breakthrough in the field of transportation, with the production of more durable metals. These could be virtually unbreakable, lighter and much more pliable, leading to planes that are 50 times lighter than at present. Those same improved capabilities will dramatically reduce the cost of travelling into space, making it more accessible to ordinary people and opening up a totally new holiday destination. In terms of technology, the computer industry will be able to shrink computer parts down to minute sizes. We need nanotechnology in order to create a new generation of computers that will work even faster and will have a million times more memory, but will be about the size of a sugar cube. Nanotechnology could also revolutionise the way that we generate power. The cost of solar cells will be drastically reduced, so harnessing this energy will be far more economical than at present. But nanotechnology has much wider applications than this and could have an enormous impact on our environment. For instance... Tiny airborne nanorobots could be programmed to actually rebuild the ozone layer, which could lessen the impact of global warming on our planet. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing thought, isn't it? On a more local scale, this new technology could help with the clean-up of environmental disasters, as nanotechnology will allow us to remove oil and other contaminants from the water far more effectively. And if nanotechnology progresses as expected, as a sort of building block set of about 90 atoms, then you could build anything you wanted from the bottom up. In terms of production, this means that you only use what you need 
and so there wouldn't be any waste. The notion that you could create anything at all has major implications for our health. It means that we'll eventually be able to replicate anything. This would have a phenomenal effect on our society. In time, it could even lead to the eradication of famine through the introduction of machines that produce food to feed the hungry. But it's in the area of medicine that nanotechnology may have its biggest impact. How we detect disease will change as tiny biosensors are developed to analyze tests in minutes rather than days. There's even speculation nanorobots could be used to slow the aging process, lengthening life expectancy. As you can see, I'm very excited by the implications that could be available to us in the next few decades. Just how long it'll take, I honestly don't know. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e. try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well, the article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback, you know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete old-fashioned even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version? Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well written. You know, people had taken a lot of care. But I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam, whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision, and so forth. Right. 
So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time consuming. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project, I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. Good afternoon. This is the first of a series of lectures I'll be giving about engineering for sustainable development. I'll be presenting examples of engineering projects from a variety of contexts, and today I'm going to talk about a project to design a new kind of greenhouse for use in the Himalayan mountain regions. First of all, I'll tell you about the problem which was the context for this project. In the Himalayan mountains, Fresh vegetables and other crops can only be grown outside for about 90 days during the summer because the altitude of the region is around 3,500 meters and because the rainfall is so low. In winter, temperatures fall below minus 25 degrees centigrade, so fresh vegetables have to be imported. They arrive by truck in summer or by air in winter which makes them expensive. Local people rely on dried leafy vegetables and stored root crops during the winter and rarely eat fresh vegetables. But despite the sub-zero temperatures, the skies over the region are cloudless and there are over 300 sunny days per year. So an engineering solution was needed to exploit the sun's energy and protect locally produced plants from freezing during winter. And in fact, there had been programs in the past to provide greenhouses, but these were unsuccessful. The greenhouses weren't adapted for local conditions, so they tended to fall into disuse. So, a few years ago, a project was initiated to design a better greenhouse, one which would meet the criteria for sustainability. So, what are the criteria for sustainability? Well, first of all, the new greenhouse is designed to be relatively simple, so construction is cheap. Locally available materials are used wherever possible. The walls are generally constructed of mud bricks, made locally, although in areas of high snowfall, more resilient walls of stone are needed. Rammed earth is also used. The main roof is generally made from locally available poplar wood with water-resistant local grass for the covering. In addition, the construction and maintenance of the greenhouse is done by local craftsmen. So local stonemasons are employed to build the greenhouse walls and specialized training is provided for them wherever necessary. Then, the greenhouse is designed to run on solar power alone. There's no supplementary heating. And lastly, families are selected to own one of the new greenhouses with great care. They have to have a site which is suitable for constructing it on. They also have to be keen to make a success of using it and also to share the produce with the wider community through sale or barter. Potential owners are taken to see existing greenhouses before they make a final decision about having one. So, those are the features which make the project sustainable. And now, I'll briefly describe the design of the greenhouse. 
The greenhouses are orientated very carefully along an east-west axis so that there's a long south-facing side. The transparent cover on the south-facing side is made from a heavy-duty polythene, which should last for at least five years. On the inside of the greenhouse, the walls are painted. The rear and west-facing walls are black to improve heat absorption, but the east-facing wall is white to reflect the morning sunlight onto the crops inside. Finally, there's a door in the wall at one end, and vents are incorporated into the roof, the door, and the wall at the other end to enable control of humidity and prevent overheating. I'll turn now to the benefits which have resulted from the introduction of these new greenhouses. These benefits are of various kinds, but for now, I'll just mention the social benefits. First of all, people who own a greenhouse gain social standing in their communities because they provide vegetables for the wider community, for regular consumption as well as for festivals, and they also earn income. Secondly, because in rural areas it is women who usually grow the food, the greenhouses have increased their opportunities. They bring the benefits of improved nutrition and increased family income from the sale of surplus produce. And thirdly, as a result of their improved financial position, some families can now afford to educate their children for the first time. We've been discussing the factors the architect has to consider when designing domestic buildings. I'm going to move on now to consider the design of public buildings, and I'll illustrate this by referring to the new Taylor Concert Hall that's recently been completed here in the city. So, as with a domestic building, when designing a public building, an architect needs to consider the function of the building. For example, is it to be used primarily for entertainment or for education or for administration? The second thing the architect needs to think about is the context of the building. This includes its physical location, obviously, but it also includes the social meaning of the building, how it relates to the people it's built for. And finally, for important public buildings, the architect may also be looking for a central symbolic idea on which to base the design, a sort of metaphor for the building and the way in which it is used. Let's look at the new Taylor Concert Hall in relation to these ideas. The location chosen was a site in a run-down district that has been ignored in previous redevelopment plans. It was occupied by a factory that has been empty for some years. The whole area was some distance from the high-rise office blocks of the central business district and shopping centre, but it was only one kilometre from the ring road. The site itself was bordered to the north by a canal, which had once been used by boats bringing in raw materials when the area was used for manufacturing. The architect chosen for the project was Tom Harrison, he found the main design challenge was the location of the site in an area that had no neighbouring buildings of any importance. To reflect the fact that the significance of the building in this quite run-down location was as yet unknown, he decided to create a building centred around the idea of a mystery, something whose meaning still has to be discovered. So, how was this reflected in the design of the building? Well, Harrison decided to create pedestrian access to the building and to make use of the presence of water on the site. As people approach the entrance, they therefore have to cross over a bridge. He wanted to give people a feeling of suspense as they see the building first from a distance and then close up and the initial impression he wanted to create from the shape of the building as a whole was that of a box. The first side that people see, the southern wall, is just a high, flat wall uninterrupted by any windows. <laughs> this might sound off-putting, but it supports Harrison's concept of the building. 
that the person approaching is intrigued and wonders what will be inside. And this flat wall also has another purpose. At night time, projectors are switched on and it functions as a huge screen onto which images are projected. The auditorium itself seats 1,500 people. The floors supported by 10 massive pads. These are constructed from rubber and so are able to absorb any vibrations from outside and prevent them from affecting the auditorium. The walls are made of several layers of honey-coloured wood, all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium and to amplify the sound, they are not straight, they are curved. The acoustics are also adjustable according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. In order to achieve this, there are nine movable panels in the ceiling above the orchestra which are all individually motorised. And the walls also have curtains which can be opened or closed to change the acoustics. The reaction of the public to the new building has generally been positive. However, the evaluation of some critics has been less enthusiastic. In spite of Harrison's efforts to use local materials, they criticise the style of the design as being international rather than local and say it doesn't reflect features of the landscape or society for which it is built.